sir, were once considered the world's most famous hacker. You're the most wanted man in computer crime, correct? Yes. Kevin Mitnick is a computer programmer run amok. I'm a genius. Leading him to hack some of the world's biggest firms. And being able to wiretap the NSA. And I did this when I was 16 years old from the computer room in high school. This story is based on the unreleased chapter in the book Kevin Mitnick co-authored called The Art of Deception. This chapter tells Kevin Mitnick's story from his own perspective. The path of Kevin's life was likely determined from an early age. Despite being a carefree child, boredom set in after his father left him when he was three. With his mother working long hours as a waitress to support him, Kevin became a self-reliant only child, spending the majority of his waking hours fending for himself. Growing up in a San Fernando Valley community, granted Kevin access to Los Angeles. By the age of 12, Kevin had ingeniously found a way to navigate the entire greater LA area without spending a dime. This revelation occurred while riding a bus, when Kevin noticed the unique pattern of the paper punch drivers used on transfer slips to mark day, time, and route. A friendly driver, in response to Kevin's strategically planted questions, revealed where to get that particular paper punch. Once Kevin knew this, he could manipulate bus transfers, originally intended for changing buses, to travel freely to a destination. Acquiring Blake transfers was a breeze. Bus terminal trash bins were overflowing with particularly used books for transfers, discarded by drivers at the end of their shifts. Armed with a pad of blanks and the punch, he could mark his own transfers and travel through the entire LA bus system. Kevin quickly became a master of the bus schedules, a testament to his remarkable memory for specific types of information. He could effortlessly recall phone calls, passwords, and other details dating back to his childhood. Another early interest that captivated Kevin was magic. Once he figured out how a new trick worked, he dedicated himself to relentless practice until he achieved mastery. Magic became an avenue through which he discovered the thrill of deceiving people, adding another layer to his multiple early pursuits. His initiation into the realm of what he would later recognize as social engineering occurred in high school when he befriended a fellow student who was immersed in the world of phone manipulation. A hacking group focused on exploring the telephone network through manipulation of phone systems and interactions with phone company personnel. Kevin was interested. His new friend demonstrated intriguing telephone tricks, such as extracting information on any customer from the telephone company and utilizing a covert test number for free long distance phone calls, which Kevin later discovered wasn't free at all, but rather billed to an unsuspecting company's MCI account. This marked Kevin's introduction to social engineering, the beginnings of this unconventional education. Under the guidance of this acquaintance and another phone free, Kevin encountered soon after, he observed their pretext calls to the phone company, getting insights into the art of sound incredible. He acquired knowledge about different phone company offices, terminology, and procedures. However, his apprenticeship was short-lived. He would embark on a solo journey, learning and refining his skills independent. Surpassing his initial mentors, the path for the next 15 years of his life was set. One of Kevin's cherished pranks involved unauthorized access to the telephone switch, where he altered the class of service for a fellow phone freak. Consequently, when the altered person attempted to make a call from home, he received a message instructing him to deposit a dime. As the telephone company switch mistakenly believed he was calling from a payphone, Kevin's fascination with telephones extended beyond their electronics, switches, and computers to encompass corporate organization, procedures, and terminology. Before long, Kevin's knowledge surpassed that of any individual employee within the telephone system. At the age of 17, Kevin had honed his social engineering prowess to the extent that he could convincingly persuade most telecom employees into almost anything, whether through face-to-face -face interactions or over the telephone. Kevin's raid into hacking commenced during his high school years, when the term hacker meant that individuals deeply engrossed in hardware and software tinkering aimed to enhance programs or streamline processes for increased efficiency. Today, the term has taken on a more negative meaning implying a malicious criminal. In late 1979, a group of fellow hackers employed by the Los Angeles Unified School District challenged Kevin to hack into the art 
Digital Equipment Corporation's computer system dedicated to developing the RSTS-E operating system software. Kevin's motivation was to gain acceptance into this hacker community and leverage their expertise to expand his understanding of operating system. These newfound friends possessed the dial-up number of the DEC computer system, but believed it was worthless within an account name and password. Underestimating others can have consequences, and in Kevin's case, hacking into the DEC system turned out to be surprisingly straightforward. Posing as Anton Chernoff, a lead developer on the project, Kevin made a simple phone call to the system manager, claiming issues with logging into one of his accounts. Kevin's persuasion skills were effective enough to convince the phone operator to grant Kevin access and let him set a password of his choosing. To add an extra layer of security, a dial-up password was required when anyone connected to the development system. The unsuspecting system administrator revealed the password, which happened to be buffoon. In less than five minutes, Kevin infiltrated Digital's RSTS-E development system, not as an ordinary user, but with all the privileges of a system developer. Initially, Kevin's newfound friends were skeptical of his achievement, refusing to believe that Kevin had successfully gained access to the ARP. In a challenging moment, one of them dialed up the system and presented Kevin with the keyboard. Its astonishment was clear as Kevin casually logged into a privileged account. Later, Kevin discovered that on the same day, they had ventured to another location and began downloading source code components of the DEC operating system. The tables turned when after obtaining the desired software, they reported to the corporate security department at DEC, alleging a breach into the company's corporate network and implicating Kevin by name. These so-called friends initially exploited Kevin's access to copy sensitive source code and ultimately betray him. The lesson learned was not an easy one, and over the years, Kevin would find himself in trouble repeatedly due to misplaced trust in people who he considered as friends. Following high school, Kevin pursued computer studies at the Computer Learning Center in Los Angeles. Within a few months, the school's computer manager realized Kevin had identified a vulnerability in the operating system, granting him full administration privileges on their IBM mini computer. Even the school's top computer experts couldn't decipher Kevin's methods. In what may have been an early instance of hire the hacker, Kevin faced a choice. Undertake an honors project to enhance the school's computer security or face suspension for hacking the system. He opted the honors project and graduated with honors. While some people dread their daily work routine, Kevin considered himself fortunate to have enjoyed his work, particularly during his time as a private investigator. Here is where Kevin refined his skills in the art of social engineering, convincing people to undertake actions they wouldn't typically do for strangers, all while being compensated. Efficiency in social engineering came naturally to Kevin, possibly inherited from generations of sales experience on his father's side. Combining with a passion for deception with the talents of influence and persuasion resulted in the profile of a social engineer. Within the realm of con artists, two specialties emerge. Those who deceive and cheat people out of their money fall under the grifter category, while individuals employing deception, influence and persuasion against businesses, typically targeting their information, belong to the social engineer category. Since Kevin's early days of the bus transfer trick, when he was too young to comprehend the ethical implications. Kevin recognized the talent for uncovering secrets he wasn't supposed to possess. Kevin further owned this ability through deception, mastering the lingo and developing a well-practiced skill of manipulation. To refine his craft, he engaged in exercises, such as convincing someone on the phone to provide information, just like practicing magic tricks. Throughout these practice sessions, Kevin discovered his ability to obtain practically any targeted information. In a later testimony, Kevin revealed, I have gained unauthorized access to computer systems at some of the largest corporations on the planet and have successfully penetrated some of the most resilient computer systems ever developed. I have used both technical and non-technical means to obtain the source code of various operating systems and telecommunication devices to study their vulnerabilities and inner workings. This exploration stem from Kevin's own curiosity, driving him to test his capabilities and uncover hidden information 
about operating systems, cell phones, and anything else that gained his interest. The pivotal moment in Kevin's life occurred when he became the focus of a July 4th, 1994 front page story on the New York Times. Overnight, the single story transformed Kevin's identity from a relatively unknown nuanced hacker into public enemy number one of cyberspace. According to John Markoff, driven by the desire to achieve fortune and armed with the power to spread false and defamatory stories on the front page of the New York Times, became a technology reporter gone astray. Markov earned over $1 million by single-handedly fabricating what Kevin would term the myth of Kevin McNick. Markov enriched himself using the same deceptive techniques Kevin employed to compromise computer systems worldwide. But in this instance, the deceived party wasn't a single computer or system administrator. It was everyone trusting the new stories in the New York Times. Cyberspace's most wanted was the title. Markov's Times article was evidently crafted to secure a book contract about Kevin's life story. Despite never having met Markov, he amassed wealth through defamatory reporting about Kevin in the Times and his 1991 book, Cyberpunk. Within the article, Markov made numerous unfounded allegations presented as facts without proper citation or the bare minimum of fact check. In this single, false and defamatory piece, Markov dubbed Kevin cyberspace's most wanted and one of the nation's most wanted computer criminals, unsupported by justification, reason or evidence. His claims included false assertions that Kevin had wiretapped the FBI, broken into Normad's computers and labelled Kevin a computer vandal despite him never intentionally damaging any access computers. These, among various other unfounded accusations, were entirely untrue and crafted to instill fear about Kevin's capabilities. In another breach of journalistic ethics, Markov failed to disclose, both in the article and all other subsequent ones, a pre-existing relationship with Kevin and a personal hostility rooted in Kevin denying to participate in the book Cyberpunk. Kevin's decision not to renew an option for a movie based on the book cost Markov a substantial amount of potential revenue, which likely influenced his skewed betrayal of Kevin in the article. Markov's piece seemed intentionally crafted to stir American law enforcement agencies, asserting law enforcement cannot seem to catch up with him. The article was clearly framed to present Kevin as cyberspace's public enemy number one with the apparent aim of pressuring the Department of Justice to elevate the priority of Kevin's case. A few months later, Markov and his collaborator, Tashumo Shamomira, played de facto government roles in Kevin's arrest, violating both federal law and journalistic ethics. They were present during an illegal search of Kevin's residence, using three blank warrants at the time of his arrest. Additionally, during the investigation, they broke federal law by intercepting one of his personal phone calls. While depicting Kevin as a villain, Markov, in a subsequent article, positioned Shamomira as the paramount hero of cyberspace. Markov floundered journalistic ethics by failing to disclose their pre-existing relationship. Shamomira, the proclaimed hero, had been a personal friend of Markov's for many years. Kevin's first interaction with Markov occurred in the late 80s, when Markov and his wife reached out to Kevin during the writing process of Cyberpunk. The book aimed to narrate the stories of three hackers, a German individual known as Pango, Robert Morris, and Kevin. When it came to compensation for Kevin's participation, the offer was nothing. I'm willing to provide my story without any benefit for myself while they profited. Kevin declined the cooperation. Frustrated by Kevin's refusal, Markov issued an ultimatum. Either participate in the interview or any information gathered from any source would be accepted as the truth. Clearly irritated, he entered at having means to make Kevin regret his decision. Despite the pressure tactics, Kevin chose to stand his ground, refusing to cooperate. Upon publication, the book portrayed Kevin as the dark side hacker. Kevin came to the conclusion that the authors intentionally added unsupported false statements to retaliate against him for not cooperating. By presenting Kevin's character in a more sinister light, they likely aimed to boost book sales. Subsequently, a movie producer expressed enthusiasm, informing Kevin that Hollywood was interested in a film based on the dark side hacker 
from Cyberpunk. Despite Kevin pointing out inaccuracies and untruths about him in the story, the producers remained excited about the project. Kevin agreed to a $5,000 payment for a two-year option with an additional $45,000 contingent on securing a production deal. As the option neared its deadline, the production company sought a six-month extension. Having found employment and lacking in motivation for a movie that depicted Kevin unfavorable, Kevin declined the extension, leading to the demise of the movie deal, including Markov's expectations of substantial earnings. This added another layer to John Markov's potential resentment towards Kevin. Around the time of Cyberpunk's publication, Markov engaged in ongoing email correspondence with his friend, Shamo Mira. Both were curiously interested in Kevin's whereabouts and activities. In one email, they mentioned learning that Kevin was attending the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and had access to the student computer lab. The question arose, where Markov and Shamo Mira contemplated another book about Kevin, or did they have some other motive for monitoring his activities? Let's rewind back to late 1992. Kevin was approaching the end of his supervised release for compromising Digital Equipment Corporation's corporate network when Kevin became aware of the government's efforts to build another case against him. This time, the focus was on allegations conducting counterintelligence to uncover the reasons behind wiretaps on the phone lines of a Los Angeles private investigation firm. Kevin's investigations confirmed that Pacific Bell Security and a computer crime deputy from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department were indeed looking into the film. Around this time, the feds orchestrated a setup using a criminal informant to entrap Kevin. Knowing Kevin monitored agencies investigating him, they had the informant befriend him and tip him off about ongoing surveillance. He also shared details of computer systems at Pacific Bell that could assist the counter-surveillance. Upon discovering his plot, Kevin swiftly turned the tables on him, exposing his involvement in credit card fraud while working as a government informant. Kevin was sure that the feds appreciated that unexpected twist. Independence Day in 1994 marked a significant shift in Kevin's life when an early morning call to Kevin's pager urged him to pick up a copy of the New York Times. Markov had not only written an article about Kevin, but the Times had prominently featured it on the front page. Concerns for Kevin's personal safety emerged as he anticipated intensified government efforts to locate him. Fortunately, the Times had chosen an outdated, unrecognizable image in an attempt to demonize him, providing a sense of relief. As Kevin delved into the article, it became apparent that Markov was positioning himself to write the Kevin McNick book he had always aspired to create. The audaciously false statements printed about Kevin left him feeling helpless. Even if he was in a position to respond, he would lack an audience comparable to the New York Times to dispute Markov's outrageous lies. While Kevin acknowledged being a nuisance, he had never engaged in the destruction of information or unauthorized use or disclosure of acquired data. The actual losses incurred by companies due to Kevin's hacking activities were limited to the expenses related to phone calls made at the company's cost, the funds sent to address security vulnerabilities exposed by Kevin's attacks, and in a few instances, potential reinstallation of operating systems and applications out of precaution. Those companies would have remained exposed to potentially more severe damage if Kevin's activities not alerted them to the vulnerabilities in the security chain. Although Kevin caused some losses, he claims his actions and intentions were not malicious. However, John Markov altered the world's perception of the threat that Kevin posed. The ability of one unethical reporter from such an influential newspaper to craft a false narrative should be a concern for everyone. The next target could be any one of us. Kevin was arrested by the FBI in 1995. Following Kevin's arrest, he was taken to county jail in Smithfield, North Carolina, where the US Marshal Service instructed jailers to place him in the hold solitary confinement. Within a week, federal prosecutors and Kevin's attorneys struck an arrangement that he felt compelled to accept. Kevin could be moved out of solitary if he agreed to waive his fundamental rights, including no bail hearing, no preliminary hearing, and no phone call, except to his attorney and two family members. To escape solitary, Kevin signed it. The federal prosecutors in his case employed every devious tactic until his release nearly five years later. 
Kevin was reportedly pressured into waiving his rights to be treated like any other accused individual. However, this was the Kevin Mitnick case, where there seemed to be no rules and no obligations to respect the constitutional rights of the accused. The case wasn't about justice, but the government's determination to win at any cost. The prosecutors had exaggerated the claims about the damage Kevin caused and the threat he posed, and the media had eagerly reported these sensationalist statements. It was now too late for the prosecutors to backtrack. They couldn't afford to lose the Mitnick case, as the world was watching. Kevin believed that the court succumbed to the fear generated by media coverage, with even more ethical journalists adopting the facts from the New York Times. The media-generated myth appeared to have even intimidated law enforcement officials. A confidential document acquired by Kevin's attorney revealed that the US Marshal Service had issued a caution to all law enforcement agents, advising them to disclose any personal information to Kevin. They risk having their lives electronically jeopardized. The Constitution mandates the presumption of innocence for the accused before trial, affording all citizens the right to a bail hearing. In this proceeding, the accused had the opportunity to be represented by counsel. They can present evidence and cross-examine witnesses. Astonishingly, these protections were avoided by the false claims by irresponsible reporters like John Marco. In an unprecedented move, Kevin was held as a pre-trial detainee, which is someone in custody pending trial or sentencing. He was there for over four and a half years. The judge's refusal to grant Kevin a bail hearing led to litigation reaching the US Supreme Court. Ultimately, Kevin's defense team informed him that he was the only federal detainee in US history denied a bail hearing. The government was not required to prove that there were no conditions of release ensuring Kevin's appearance in court. Unlike a prior case where federal prosecutors suggested that a defendant could start a nuclear war by whistling into a payphone, the most serious charges against Kevin pertain to copying source code for various cellular phone handsets and popular operating systems. Despite this, the prosecutors publicly and in court alleged that Kevin had caused a collective loss exceeding $300 million to multiple companies. The specific details of these loss amounts remained sealed with the court, allegedly to protect the involved companies. However, Kevin's defense team set forth that the prosecutor's request to seal the information was intended to conceal their misconduct in the case. It's noteworthy that none of the victims in Kevin's case reported any losses to the Securities and Exchange Commission as mandated by law. This raises the possibility that either numerous multinational companies violated federal law, deceiving the SEC, stakeholders and analysts, or the losses attributed to Kevin's hacking were too significant to warrant reporting. In Jonathan Littman's book, The Fugitive Game, it is reported that within a week of the New York Times front page story, Marcos' agent successfully negotiated a comprehensive deal with the publisher Walt Disney Hyperion for a book detailing the pursuit to apprehend Kevin. The estimated advance for this book was around $750,000. Additionally, there were no plans for a Hollywood movie, with Miramax securing the option for $200,000 and a total payment of $650,000 upon the start of the filming. A confidential source has indicated that Markov's deal was even more lucrative than initially thought by Littman. Consequently, John Markov earned approximately a million dollars, while Kevin faced five years of legal consequences. Buck Bloombecker, a former prosecutor in the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, wrote a book titled Spectacular Computer Crimes. In it, he expressed the disappointment in his former colleague, stating, it grieves me to have to write about my former colleagues in less than flattering terms. He went on to reveal Assistant United States Attorney James Asperger's admission that much of the argument to keep Kevin behind bars was based on rumors that ultimately didn't hold to be true. Bloombecker raised concerns about the false allegations becoming the basis for Kevin's contributed detention without the possibility of posting bail, suggesting that it may have influenced the court's consideration for a fair sentence. In 1999, Forbes article written by Adam L. Penenberg characterized Kevin's actions as curiously innocuous. He pointed out that while Kevin did break into corporate computers, there was no evidence of data destruction or selling of copied information, despite even searching software that Kevin left behind. The article asserted 
that Kevin's offences were two thumb his nose at the costly computer security systems employed by larger corporations. In the book, The Fugitive Game, Jonathan Lippmann said, Greed the government could understand, but a hacker who wielded power for its own sake was something they couldn't grasp. Lippmann later revealed that US Attorney James Sanders conceded to Judge Faeser that the damage Kevin caused to the DEC was not the sensational $4 million, but rather $160,000. Even this amount was not attributed to direct damage by Kevin, but represented the approximate cost of tracing the security weaknesses that Kevin's intrusions had brought to DEC's attention. The government admitted it lacked evidence for the claims that had contributed to holding Kevin without bail and in solitary confinement. There was no proof that Kevin compromised the security of the NSA, issued a false press release for Security Pacific Bank, or altered the TRW credit report of a judge. Despite the absence of proof, the judge who was possibly influenced by sensational media coverage rejected the plea bargain and sentenced him to a longer term than even the government sought after. During Kevin's years as a hacker hobbyist, he gained unwarranted notoriety, featuring in numerous news reports, magazine articles, and several books. Markov and Chima Mira's defamatory book was adopted into the film, Takedown. When the script surfaced online, Kevin's supporters protested outside Miramax Films, highlighting the inaccurate and false portrayal of him. Faced with the pressure from Kevin's supporters, the production company opted to settle the case on undisclosed terms. Despite John Markov's unfounded and defamatory characterizations of Kevin, Kevin's offenses were limited to computer trespassing and making unauthorized telephone calls. Kevin had openly acknowledged the illegalities of his actions since his arrest, admitting to invasion of privacy. However, to assert reason or evidence, as the Markov article did without justification, that Kevin had defrauded others of their money or property through computer and wire fraud is categorically false and unsupported by unavailable facts. Kevin's transgressions were driven by curiosity. He sought to understand the inner workings of phone networks and delve into the complexities of computer security. From being a youngster fascinated by performing magic tricks, Kevin evolved into the world's most notorious hacker, instilling fear in corporations and the government alike. While this chapter provides insights from Kevin Mitnick's perspective on his own life, a lot of his arguments carried a lot of weight, like the lack of evidence showing the amount caused and damages to these larger companies. However, a lot of information has been released since this story, including him actually wiretapping the NSA at 16 years old. Remember, this story came out 20 years ago, so take it with a grain of salt. We have to remember that Kevin Mitnick was a master of social engineering and manipulation. Following his release in 2000, Mitnick transitioned into a career as a paid security consultant, public speaker, and author. He engaged in security consulting, offering penetration testing services, and conducting social engineering classes for various companies and government agencies. Kevin established Mitnick Security Consulting, LLC, a computer security consultancy, and held a share in No Before a provider of a comprehensive platform for security awareness training and simulated phishing testing. Additionally, he served as an active advisory board member at Zimperium, a company specializing in the development of mobile intrusion prevention systems. On July 16th, 2023, at the age of 59, Kevin Mitnick passed away due to pancreatic cancer at a hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At the time of his death, he was married and his wife was expecting their first child. A truly sad way for anyone to pass away. Regardless on your own thoughts on Kevin Mitnick, one thing we can all agree on is that he helped shape the security landscape as we know it today. Thank you for watching. If you liked that video, be sure to subscribe and click another video on screen if you're interested.